and thus placed within the available area in the logic core. Uh, here, for simplicity, we're leaving our names, analog macros, and we're just looking at the standard cells, uh, all placed in nice, even rows. Uh, I mentioned that this is a simplified list design, so it's easy. We actually have room left over after fitting the cells into, into rows. So if we zoom into the rows, they actually look fairly sparse. But you can see here's a flip flop. It's one of the widest cells. Here is a, uh, here's a, an inverter. It's the, the most narrow cell in the same row. And um, um, this placement algorithm in IC compiler is timing driven. So it, it is attempting to at least estimate the lengths of the various connections. And, and try to achieve a placement that will make it easy to meet timing. So it's considered a timing-driven command. Once PlaySoft is done, every standard cell in the, in the synthesized netlist has a definite XY location. We could look at this flip-flop and uh, click on it and find out its exact XY location. And that will be important when we do clock tree synthesis in, in a moment. Okay, here's a closer look at um, a f just a few standard cell rows. Uh, here we're using our simplified um, illustration. And so we're looking inside a single uh, standard cell block. And we're just limiting this to two layers of metal, M1 and M2. Uh, in, uh, in most technologies, every metal layer has a preferred direction, either horizontal, uh, in the case of M1, or vertical, uh, in our illustration, M2. And uh, uh, in, in this illustration, we're allowing room between the standard cell rows to allow for routing. Uh, this used to be quite common in the early days of chip design, but now that we have 9, 10, 11 pairs of metal in a typical technology, found they're necessary. So uh, typically we would use Another option in the initialize floor plan command to set the core utilization to 100%. Uh, right now it's only 30%. If we set it to 100%, it would say, okay, I guess we don't need any. Charles, can you hear? Writing channel, the enough metal layers, if you must look further in the text, then we get the captain to enter the physical domain back. Uh, question. 
Wait, the chance uh -huh. is you are like one and off. And then? Yeah, you uh, you are like on and off. So uh, there was some uh, some like uh, couple of minutes we we uh, cannot hear you. So something happened. Did you do something? Oh, oh, oh. oh. No, I didn't do anything. Oh, okay, uh, fine. That slide should have been that too. Mm -hmm. This not the one. Uh, yeah, can you go back to slide 19? Uh, no, uh, no, 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 20, 20, 20, this one. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, we, did, we didn't skip much. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start again from slide 20. So, uh, so here we're zooming in to just a few rows of standard cells. Uh, and uh, in this simplified example, uh, we're only drawing two memory layers, M1, which uh, runs horizontally as its preferred direction, and M2, which runs vertically uh, as its preferred direction. And uh, in the earlier days of Silicon Valley, uh, we only did have two or three metal layers. And so it was necessary to allow space for routing between the rows of standard sets, uh, uh, as, as shown here by these routing channels. And um, the command which controls the width of the channels is, when we saw earlier, initialize floor plan. One of its options is dash core utilization. So here we're allowing 60% of the logic core, that inner rectangle, for routing. Only 40% is used for the standard cell rows themselves. Um, so you can get a, a, a good view of how the interconnections are made uh, by traversing along vertical middle two connecting to horizontal middle one, back to middle two, and so on, until you've connected this standard cell to another standard cell. Well, today, uh, we have more layers of middle, typically 10 or 11. We really don't move the routing channels on a typical chip. So, we can set the core utilization to 100%. And that means the standard cell rows can actually abut, they can adjoin one another. Uh, when you do that, ICC will ask you, okay, do you want me to flip every other standard cell row? Um, the advantage of flipping this row is that its ground row will then be on top. It doesn't change the functionality to mirror this row about the horizontal axis. So its ground row is on top, and it can be abutted to or merged with the ground row on this adjacent standard cell row. So the rows of cells can be abutted very compactly. At this point, we're done with placement. And as a result, every flip-flop in the entire design, every, every clocked memory, for that matter, um, has a definite XY location. So at this point, we're ready to begin routing the clock net to every clock pin on all of these storage elements. Now, back in the synthesis phase, back in the logical domain, uh, we, we did uh, very little to synthesize the clock tree. Uh, 
logic synthesis tools view clock nets as idealized signals. Uh, and uh, they assume little, little or no skew, little difference in arrival time of the clock edge at this flip flop or that flip flop. Uh, and so they, they do not add buffering, uh, even though the clock net has a very high fan out. And, and uh, that makes sense because uh, we want to leave buffering the clock tree to a physically aware tool like IC compiler. So all we did in the logic synthesis domain was to specify some of the timing constraints related to our clock. For example, uh, here we're specifying a one nanosecond period between rising clock edges. And so any delay path from one flip-flop through gate logic to some other flip-flop would have to propagate within one nanosecond or less. Uh, taking into account the setup time on this destination flop. But now, in IC compiler, we're going to insert clock tree buffers that will ensure that, in spite of a very high fan out, this, this clock net may fan out to tens of thousands of flops, uh, but by buffering the tree intelligently, will still ensure minimal skew, minimal spread in arrival time at the different flops. Okay, so here's the core command within IC compiler that routes the clock connections. Uh, it's called clock opt. It has many options. Here we're just showing one of them. Um, this tells the clock up command that um, it should automatically fix any hold time violations that it can see. Uh, but its main job is to insert buffers, usually dedicated clock tree buffers available in the standard cell library. Uh, you can see it's inserting these buffers and creating a nice symmetric clock tree that will minimize the skew at any given flip-flop on the die. And, uh, and so uh, when this clock opt command finishes, uh, we, we now have uh, uh, a well-buffered clock tree in place that will take uh, the clock signal uh, arriving at our clock input pad that we saw earlier uh, and route it uh, to all the flip-flops uh, within a given clock domain. And um, uh, typically, we are routing these signals using a Manhattan paradigm. Uh, routing is a very CPU-intensive problem. We're talking about connections between millions of cells. Uh, in computer science lingo, it's an NP-complete problem. And so to keep things simple, uh, we, we lay down metal interconnects, routing segments, uh, along vertical and horizontal directions. We don't do line of flight. So it's uh, called Manhattan geometry because in, in Manhattan, uh, the streets are laid out north, south, and the avenues are laid out east, west. Very different from Moscow, which has five concentric rings, but uh, we, we still do this Manhattan geometry. So, so we can, uh, as shown here in detail view, uh, we can uh, use our cursor in IC compiler to click 
between two flip-flops, nearby flip-flops, and it will show us, using these rules in white, the exact Manhattan distance, the total vertical plus horizontal distance between them. And uh, as I mentioned, metal lines have a preferred direction. Metal one being horizontal in our example, metal two, and, and any even number metal layer being vertical. So we still uh, simplify the routing problem by calculating Manhattan distance. Okay, at this point we have completed the clock synthesis step. Uh, by the way, it's um, worth mentioning that um, each of these IC compiler core commands, uh, CTS, uh, or clock opt, uh, as well as route opt that we're going to visit shortly, are capable of doing synthesis. Uh, so they have some limited synthesis ability. Uh, they're not meant for synthesizing an entire hierarchical system on chip, a big risk design like uh, design compiler is, but they, they certainly do have the ability to synthesize buffers, uh, correct whole time violations, and uh, perform other common synthesis tasks. So that brings us to the route out phase. Uh, we're going to route all of the data connections described in the Verilog netlist files. We've completed the clocking connections, so that leaves the data connections. And this is such a complex problem, such an NP-complete problem, that we break up the problem into global routing and detail routing. This all happens transparently once the user or his script um, executes the route opt command. It has a global phase and a detail phase. So the global phase uh, determines the best line of attack to connect two standard cells in this RTL block A from our simplified illustration. Um, it does not pay attention to things like which metal layer am I writing on, uh, what's the resistance of a via, or is my design rule met, metal to metal spacing. So global routing ignores those physical details in an effort to come up with an optimal um, connection path. And uh, the route out command during global routing will try its best to minimize the total net length. Uh, which is an intuitive goal when you're looking for an efficient uh, solution to the writing problem for all of these hundreds of thousands of pin-to-pin -pin connections. Now, even though it will try to minimize overall net length, yet it's still aware of our timing goals that we further annotated into IC compiler. Uh, via the synopsis design constraint file. And for a real chip, that file can be quite lengthy. It can have very detailed input and output and register to register timing goals, um, even between submodules. Uh, so here's an example of where the router rethinks the global route of one net to improve the timing and fix a possible violation. Uh, let's look at trial run first. Here, we've done a global route from the driving pin A1. Maybe it's the key output of a standard cell flop in this row, in this submodule. 
and notice it fans out to not one but four destinations in these four blocks. And this looks like a good trial route because it's achieved pretty much the minimal length for that kind of connection. Here's the problem. Um, the let command uh, estimates that the timing is too slow and will violate one of our constraints. So we'll go to trial two where transparently the write up command rethinks its strategy and says, well, this trial gave us minimum length, but we're going to have to sacrifice that minimal length and make the route a little bit longer. Notice here we're going horizontally and then vertically. So this connection, because we, we sacrifice um, uh, some extra length in order to minimize the time it takes to get from A1 to D1. That's where the timing violation was. So this fixes the timing at the expense of a slightly longer global route. And so make these trade-offs thousands of times as it completes the route all across the chip, implementing all of the data interconnections. Now we're almost ready to go over into detail routing. Uh, this slide shows how we, we go from global to detailed. In the global route phase, the entire logic core is conceptually divided into routing tiles. This is uh, ICC specific, but uh, most other tools use a similar concept. Uh, so we'll, we'll stick, for simplicity, we'll stick to two levels of metal. Uh, metal, metal one, shown in, in blue, preferred horizontal direction, and metal two, shown in yellow, 